Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Command and General Staff College's panel discussion on emotional intelligence and its influence in decision making. Today's panel is facilitated by the Department of Command and Leadership. General Foley, Command Sergeant Mean Helton, distinguished guests, thank you and welcome. Before we begin, allow me to provide a quick sequence of events uh, for our discussion, along with some background information on our participants. Uh, our agenda for today, we're going to start off with a brief introduction to emotional intelligence from each of the panel members, uh, providing an overview of EI from their specific vantage point, along with why it's important to leaders. Following that topical overview, uh, we'll open the floor up for questions, both for our in-person members and for those of you that are on Facebook Live. Finally, we'll conclude with methods for you to continue your own learning into emotional intelligence and ways that you can uh, incorporate this into your lives. With the agenda out of the way, allow me to introduce the panel members. First, Dr. Trent Lithgow. Dr. Lithgow earned his PhD in political science from the University of Kansas. Dr. Lithgow's research interests include adaptive leadership, command and control, civil relations, and professional military norms. Keep your eyes open for Trent's upcoming article in Military Review, Kudoy and Cognition, How to Build Adaptive Tactical Experts. It explores how deliberate practice, metacognition, and emotional intelligence enable effective battlefield leadership. Dr. Lithgow is a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and two-time Command and General Staff College Instructor of the Year. Next is Professor uh, Gerald, excuse me, Pro Professor Gerald <laughs> Swell, excuse me. <laughs> Professor Swell is a, a master, has a master's in education and human development earned at George Washington University and currently is working on his doctorate in organizational psychology. His academic interests include a focus on emotional intelligence among military leaders. And in fact, he's the author of the book, Emotional Intelligence for Military Leaders, available on Amazon.com. Gerald is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel as well, serving 19 years as an instructor at the Command and General Staff College. And last in our order going down from left to right, my left to right, is Lieutenant Colonel Amelia Schroeder. Colonel Schroeder earned her bachelor's in psychology from Louisiana Tech, along with a master's in military arts and science from right here at the Command and General Staff College. Her current research focus is on the theory of action for military professionals with an emphasis on influencing techniques, organizational change, and motivation in team building. Amelia's background in interpersonal relations and team building goes far beyond her time in the military or her most recent assignment as the Sakyur uh, JICE Chief and Collections Manager. Before joining the military, she was a social work counselor as well as a high school and, and middle school educator and an interscholastic uh, coach. On the administrative side, we have two other personnel here. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Ward is helping to arrange today's events along with managing the Facebook side of the house. So he'll take all of the comments coming from the outside stations. Myself, I'll be your facilitator today, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Rouse, the Department of Command and Leadership. At this point, we'll open the floor to the panelists to begin our discussion. Gerald. The floor is yours for any opening comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's Gerald Sewell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Gerald. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. So what is emotional intelligence and what is it good for? I'll start out giving a couple definitions from a couple experts, although there are many out there. Uh, professors Peter Salovey and John Mayer of Yale and uh, University of New Hampshire, respectively, in a 1990 paper on this subject, defined EI as the subset of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor one, one's own and others' feelings and emotions, to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. Daniel Goleman writes, emotional intelligence is the capacity for recognizing our own feelings 
and those of others for motivating ourselves and for managing emotions well in ourselves and within our relationships. Once again, these are but two of a variety of definitions and EI constructs. There's as many models, as many assessment instruments as there are definitions, but they all are pointing to the same thing. They all are discussing the emotions, understanding them and applying their understanding to improving ourselves and our relationships. I believe that Goldman, Salve, Mayer, and the rest of the experts are speaking of the very skills that make leaders successful. These EI skills are critical interpersonal skills that are key competencies for leaders. The military has always stressed the importance of interpersonal tact and interpersonal skills. Uh, ADP 6-22 describes interpersonal tact as relying on understanding and character, reactions and motives of oneself and others. 622 also discusses composure and calls that emotional self-control. The Army Leadership Requirements Model includes empathy and other EI-related concepts as key leader attributes. All are key elements of emotional intelligence. The Army and its Leadership Doctrine, as well as in several leader assessments, has recognized the need for emotional intelligence. Assessments such as the BCAP, CCAP, and Capital Athena assessments support the Army's recognition of and the emphasis on the importance of leaders ex exercising high degrees of emotional intelligence. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Professor Sewell. See, I can't say it properly. <laughs> Next, we'll go down to Lieutenant Colonel Schroeder, and if you could present your initial thoughts on emotional intelligence. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm here today because, as Eric previously mentioned, I have a lifelong interest in the human domain and the fundamentals of motivation specifically. That curiosity did begin many, many, many years ago in childhood when I observed that positional power won't necessarily uh, be the only way that we can motivate and influence behavior. So moving forward, studying and experience in the field of leadership really scoped my interest to that application of personal power in order to be able to influence, motivate people, uh, especially when you have diverse talent within your team that you're trying to build, to be able to get them to really feel like they're on a team and work towards individual and collective desired outcomes. Emotional intelligence is perhaps the most universally adaptive relevant skill to be able to build teams, develop people, create a positive organizational climate, and achieve desired outcomes. Why? Why is that? So my search, as Eric mentioned, the, the theory in action, the search for the why, simply stated because emotions motivate. They motivate people to action. And EI is a skill set. It's what I love about it. It's not an abstract concept, which means it can be developed and improved. All published models include subsets of attributes and competencies such as self-confidence, empathy, and time management. And working to improve these things presents a deliberate challenge for each one of us. But when we do so, we are enabled to achieve tangible and intangible results. For the leader, that might be improving your interpersonal relationships and your resiliency. And for the organization, it might be efficiency and retention. That self-development process leverages individual existing strengths, but also provides concrete steps to improve our weaker areas. And the result that we're looking for is holistic leaders, capable of adapting to meet leadership demands, but also comfortable letting others be themselves while leveraging diverse strengths for the team, the unit, and our mission. And I, too, look forward to the questions and thoughts that will be shared during our time together today. Thanks, Amelia. Dr. Lithgow, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm on this panel uh, by somewhat of an accidental circumstance. Uh, I didn't set out to learn about uh, emotional intelligence, uh, but I happened into it a few years ago. I embarked on a research project uh, that explores how the Army can develop more effective battlefield leaders, and during the course of that research, uh, I explored a lot of probably predictable and familiar areas, um, the psychology of decision making certainly, uh, and how stress, risk, and uncertainty affect our ability to make decisions. Uh, but this research also led me to a surprising conclusion, and that is that emotional intelligence is an essential skill for battlefield leadership. Uh, so why is that? Uh, it's really not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of effective battlefield leaders uh, as being emotionally intelligent. 
uh, but nevertheless, it's a critical skill. Uh, you know, my boss, Mr. Schaffner, is, is fond of saying that um, warfare is a thinking person's game, and we cannot separate cognition from emotion. As much as we might like to, uh, quote, unquote, take the emotions out of decision making, we can't. Uh, it's part of who we are. Um, it's part of being human. And moreover, when we're in combat, that motivates some pretty strong emotions. Uh, fear, anger, uh, and the list goes on. So that means for us that recognizing and regulating our emotions, which are both EI skills, uh, are essential to having effective thinking and making good decisions on the battlefield. I think another uh, maybe colloquial myth around emotions and decision making is that they're bad to the extent that they influence, uh, emotions influence our decisions, uh, that results in bad decisions, and to the extent that they don't, that it gives us, uh, maybe motivates good decisions. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, emotions can inhibit our decision making, uh, but they can also enable it. Uh, for example, emotions are an important part of our intuitive decision making. So we have experienced leaders who say, I have a gut feeling uh, about something. A lot of that is their intuitive decision making uh, coming to them along with an emotion, a positive emotion uh, or perhaps a sense of fear or something that's kind of married up with that intuition that suggests uh, an intuitive course of action. So if we have the right expertise uh, and we are emotionally aware, emotions can help motivate us in good ways uh, rather than inhibit our decision making. Uh, so again, uh, I'm uh, really pleased to be on the panel, especially since I'm here with um, people who have a lot more expertise in this area than uh, I do, and I look forward to uh, discussing your questions. Thanks. All right. We have now opened up into the question and answer time period. I am going to ask the first set of questions to our panelists, and I ask you to go ahead and start coming down with your own thoughts and questions that you may have for the panelists in just a few moments. Uh, Gerald? You provided uh, some definitions of emotional intelligence as part of your opening there. How would one gauge their own emotional intelligence and improve their own level of that intelligence as they continue in their military career? Thanks, Eric, for that question. Uh, initially, you have to you know, know yourself, because I guess the foundation of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. The foundation of knowing who we are is self-awareness. I like to call it self-knowledge. I can be aware, but how deeply have I taken that to look at myself to you know, find out what motivates me? Um, when talking about how do I recognize how much emotional intelligence I have, you know, it's, uh, it's really about relationships. You know, how am I getting along with people? How are I responding to my environment? You know, how are folks responding to me? You know, it's, it, th but the key there is recognizing that, you know, hey, this thing, these things, you know, I'm not working right. Things aren't going well with me in my relationships or as I try to operate in this organization. And once again, I have, I have to get back to is all those self awareness There are folks who it's okay, you know, to not really have those relationships. I can, I can, you know, I can, uh, I can be successful in my environment without the self worth without emotional intelligence. You know, so we think. But the key is, if I'm thinking, looking, and seeing things aren't as well as they could be. You know, maybe there's something else I can do. Maybe it's, you know, how I am I'm, I'm showing empathy, how I am understanding where other folks are. Or maybe it's just that, you know, I'm so arrogant because I am who I am and I know who I am and I can do these things this way. But we have to kind of get to a point where we look at what's going on from the other side. You know, I, I'm happy here, but, you know, what's my climate like in the organization? You know, are folks coming to me for information or for folks sharing with me or, Am I having to go get information? Um, so the first step is recognizing I need more emotional intelligence. You know, and once again, some folks won't recognize that. So every now and then we need a confidant. We need, we need a friend to come along and say, hey, you know, why don't you try this? But once we get that knowledge, there are a number of things we can do to improve our emotional intelligence. The first step is, once again, self-awareness. Be aware that, hey, something's not working right here. The second step is, you know, okay, you know, is, and I, I like to say, you know, is, if you get a, an assessment, you know, emotional t EI self EI assessment, which will identify for you, you know, here are some areas that you might want to work on. Maybe your social awareness isn't good. Maybe you're not as aware of yourself as you need to. And then there are key steps that you can kind of work through to improve on those areas. In our EI elective, we provide a, an assessment to the students 
where they can, with this particular assessment, it gives them EI skills and says, you know, you're good here, you're okay here, but you really need to work on these. You know, then they can take a look at that and kind of do a reflection, yeah, that's right, or maybe it isn't, but you know, if it says that, is there something going on there? And then we provide a tool where they can, can focus on developing those skills. But the first step is really awareness, awareness, self-awareness that, hey, you know, I'm not all I can be. I'm not really interacting as positively with the folks around me as I can. I think, Amelia, you may have some uh, inputs as well, please. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Um, yeah, absolutely, and the first concept that's really important to understand that sort of is a yes and to what Gerald was saying is the awareness, particularly when we have a negative emotional state that takes over, uh, and being able to identify and then handle or manage uh, and to achieve a better outcome. So for instance, going into today's panel, if you have an identification of the emotion that we're feeling, I'd probably go with nervous a little bit nervous to sit in front of your peers and a little bit unknown, how is the discussion gonna go? What kind of questions are we gonna be asked? Are we facing a skeptical audience? And so being able to identify the emotion that you are experiencing and then make some type of meaning out of that. How do I, how do I manage that? How do I handle this? What can I do then? And then what can I do going forward to either move it to a different emotional state or leverage it and the power of it, because like I said before, emotions motivate, leverage the power of the emotion for a positive outcome. Now let's say it's something a little more extreme and someone has a negative reaction. Some of you probably have experienced that maybe in the classroom, maybe in a meeting maybe with a significant other or a family member where something is said and someone is triggered and has an extreme negative reaction. And then where do we go from there? So Gerald talked about the importance of the interpersonal relationships and building those. Emotional intelligence um, is a skill set that can help you with both of those situations. But when the extreme situation happens, we have to look to science to say, okay, what's really going on there? You know, if we want to analyze, it's not just about emotions. There's actually brain chemistry happening uh, when you see someone have a disproportionate response to a triggering event. Uh, it's happening in the brain. The science tells us, I'm not a neuroscientist, but you know, we certainly are, have access to the data that tells us what's happening in the brain is normal cognitive thought. So if you're having a conversation or a meeting or a rational discussion with someone, analytical thought happens in the frontal lobes. So we call that the cognitive brain. Thoughts are happening in the cognitive brain. When the body is triggered, adrenaline and cortisol are stimulated to be released. That happens from the amygdala. Going all the way back to high school biology, college biology, remember that weird part of the brain that's in the back called the amygdala. So that's called an amygdala hijack. Cortisol, adrenaline are released into the body. That's a chemical reaction. And until those chemicals are dissipated and reabsorbed or processed out, you're going to be in a state where your cognitive brain is not receiving the same sort of capability, not receiving the same sort of blood flow, not receiving the same oxygen levels, that, and so you can't react well with your cognitive brain. So how do we overcome that? It's similar to the process I just described, even when the reaction isn't so extreme. The first thing is to identify what you're feeling. I'm feeling angry. Usually that's a severe negative emotion. So I'm angry, I'm fearful, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I feel aggressive about something. And then that's labeling it. Labeling it is the first step. What am I feeling? So if you haven't taken any sort of steps to improve your emotional vocabulary, it can, that may seem like a daunting task. You know, when we do the concrete experiences here in school, we ask the students sometimes, you know, what was your immediate reaction? Another way of saying that is, how'd that make you feel? Well, I've observed that I get a really different response when I ask that same question a different way. How did it make you feel? Students, oh, feelings? What? No, we didn't, I didn't bring any of those today. But if I say, what was your immediate reaction, they'll usually describe a feeling in some way or another. So teaching ourselves to speak with an emotional vocabulary is the first step in being able to uh, generate or build this type of skill set. The second is to be able to then identify, well, what, what caused this emotion? What is causing this emotion? 
And the third is what can I do about it? And what can I do about it offers a, a lot of steps, which we can talk a little bit more about as we go through the panel, but there's a lot of what you can do about it. And that's some of what we cover in our emotional intelligence elective, but also in some of the other classes uh, that we do here at CGSOC. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Lithgow, uh, there's, you've done some recent writing on the combination between emotion and uh, intuition. Where is the common ground between those two and the balance uh, that we find between those? Yeah, so I would, uh, I, I have, and there, there is a tight connection between our intuitive decision making uh, and emotion. Uh, so uh, I think emotions, uh, it's not necessarily a balance, but it's a connection and they're connected in three, three ways. The first one I already mentioned, and that's uh, through our gut feelings. So when we perceive a positive or a negative gut feeling that we ought uh, to do something or not, uh, that's a combination of our intuition and our emotion uh, trying to motivate us to action. So I had, uh, in a previous life, I was a, a helicopter pilot and I had a, an experienced flight instructor who would always advise pilots to listen to your spidey senses. Right, listen to your, your gut feeling. Um, Hal Moore, who we just covered in our leadership curriculum not too long ago, uh, talks about how uh, when he had, when there's a conflict between his gut and his brain, what he thought he should do, he'd always kind of go with his um, gut. Um, so emotions or gut feelings can be a reliable guide to action, but the two gentlemen that I just mentioned, what you'll notice is they were very experienced in their field. Hal Moore was a very experienced battlefield commander, and the gentleman that I, I spoke of um, was a very experienced pilot and instructor pilot. And so they had this really attuned sense of intuitive decision making. And again, this is something we're going to cover um, for the students in our leadership uh, lesson this week, uh, is talking about the role of experience and intuition in our decision making, and when can you trust it. So if we're in an experience, a situation where we have a lot of experience um, and we have a lot of expertise, then these gut feelings can be a good, uh, you know, they can be very reliable guide to action. And we can follow our gut and generally get uh, good results. But if we're not, uh, then we have to know when our tuition is uh, not reliable. So that is a, a key skill for battlefield leaders, not only to know when you can rely on your gut and use it to make those quick decisions, but to know when you can't and when you need to step back, um, do a little bit more deliberate processing or get outside advice or some combination. Um, a second way that our emotions affect our intuition is through depth of thought. Uh, and this uh, is because emotions, although they're tightly connected with intuition, emotions actually precede cognition. And I'll talk about why that is in a minute. So when we experience an emotion, that influences the way we subsequently think. Uh, now, when we talk about our intuitive system of decision making, we can contrast that with our more deliberative sy uh, system. And if you read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, this is system one and system two processing, right? So system one processing is intuitive, it's easy. Uh, system two is more deliberate and effortful. But depending on the emotions we're experiencing, they may uh, predispose us to using one of those systems more than the other. So when we have positive emotions, that signals to us that it's a safe environment and that we don't need to bring system two online. We can afford to just kind of take it easy and keep going with our intuitive uh, decision making and, and not really focus. Negative emotions, on the other hand, signal threat. Uh, so that makes us more likely to bring our uh, deliberate processing online. Uh, the other thing is um, it's not just positive or negative, but the certainty associated with emotions. So high certainty emotions, uh, even negative ones like anger, tend to make us uh, more predisposed to make intuitive decisions, to act based on our intuition rather to step back and think. Now there's, I don't want to assign like a, like a normative or judgmental value to system one or system two. Uh, they can both be useful and are useful in different situations. Uh, but you can imagine where the, this uh, might be a hindrance instead of a help. So for example, um, if we're having negative emotions uh, that are signaling threat to us, our tendency may want to be to um, gather more information, particularly if it's a low certainty situation. This is a situation that battlefield leaders often find themselves in, negative combined with uncertainty. And then what do we want? We want to bring our deliberate processing online and we want to try to find more information. Uh, this can be good, but it can also inhibit us from making a timely decision if a decision needs to be made. 
so one of the things that I focus on, on in my elective, which is uh, hacking the tactical brain, and it, we talk about battlefield decision making, is um, getting comfortable in uncertainty and being willing to um, seek out more information if you need it, but not spend too much time on it and make a timely decision if a timely decision uh, needs to be made. Uh, so that's the second way, and then the last uh, one is I'll just kind of pile on to what uh, Amelia said, and that's when we experience an amygdala hijacking. Uh, so the reason that that happens, uh, that we experience this hijacking, the reason that emotions precede cognition is that they are a survival tool. The, emotionary, the, um, the evolutionary purpose of emotions is to motivate immediate action. So we, it makes us want to do something right now. Uh, and that's been a very useful survival tool for us in the past, uh, but in today's you know, complex world, it's, we don't always need to do something right now. But yet these chemicals are uh, telling us to do that. So we need to be prepared for that. Uh, it, you know, we need to recognize that it can happen, and then, you know, as Amelia said, develop these techniques that can help us stave off the effects of motivating immediate action when that's not appropriate, um, do a little bit of thinking, um, and then take an approach to decision making uh, that's a little bit more based, uh, well, a lot more based on um, some sort of deliberate, um, even if short deliberate thought, rather than just kind of this instinct to do something right now. Thank you very much, Trent. We'll go ahead and open the floor for questions at this time. If you have a microphone in front of you, you can go ahead and push on the microphone to activate it. If otherwise you don't, there is a microphone available in the back of the room. Online, please go ahead and put your information into the chat window and we'll be able to go from there. Yes, sir. I have a question real quick. I'd like to address it to uh, Amelia. Um, you had mentioned the uh, amygdala hijacking. How long does it take for the amygdala to return to normal once it gets hijacked? That's a good question, because uh, it's a relevant question for the action piece, right? So if you have been triggered and or you are observing someone else who has been triggered into an amygdala hijack, the science tells us somewhere between 17 and 19 minutes is average for people to actually be able to return to full cognitive functionality. So if you're an instructor or you're a student here, you might have noticed that if someone seems triggered in class, it's probably about 20 minutes before they seem like they're able to come back and participate fully in the discussion or the activity of the day. Some of you are smiling. I, I, I know you've, you've observed this phenomenon, right? So the, the science also tells us that you can shorten that time by doing some of the, the things we talked about before, identification, Return the cognitive brain to action. Label that emotion. Why am I feeling this way? Use your words, use language. Come back to a place where your frontal lobes are engaged. And there are claims that people can reduce uh, their time spent in that hijacked state down to just a couple of minutes. I don't know, you do get better with practice in terms of being able to, to manage this skill, uh, but sometimes, it's helpful to plan ahead. So if there's something that you know that triggers you in particular, maybe it's an individual, maybe it's a challenge to one of your core values, maybe it's your confidence in going in, maybe there's been an interaction before, some sort of topic or issue that seems to be contentious or problematic. You can absolutely prepare by establishing the main points, the issues, that you want to make sure that you return to in the event that uh, emotional hijacks or amygdala hijacks start to happen. You can have key phrases that you rehearse. Uh, for me, phrases like, hmm. Because you know what I can't do? Well, I'm going, hmm. I can't speak. The mouth closes. So there's no possible way that some other unintended, regrettable thing is going to come out while I'm saying, Hmm. It allows you to pause. Okay, the second phrase that I really go to is, do you really believe that? So when you're having an interaction with someone and they've said something that you find triggering, maybe they've, you know, you feel insulted by something they've said, you can absolutely, do you really believe that? Enable that conversation. If another, a third one is, there are some things worth considering. Let's take it away from personal challenges, take it away from personalities, 
and just let's keep it at the issues at hand. I use that one in class all the time. There are some things worth considering. You know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that's completely wrong-headed thinking, right? Like that's not, that's not where we want to go because that might trigger someone. But there are some things worth considering. Let's revisit the problem, revisit the issues, and then decide what we can do about it if there are alternate perspectives that we could consider. If you're dealing with other people and they seem triggered and you're still using your frontal lobe to its full capacity, then you can address them. Number one, use their name. Absolutely use their name. So if I were talking to Gerald and I observe he's having an amygdala hijack and I need him to, to return to cognitive thought process, I might, I might just use his name, Gerald. Whatever you say after that, you've allowed them to sort of return. I am speaking to you. You want to help them feel understood. So maybe I'll restate the problem or the issue from what I think his perspective is. You know, if we were talking about coming in today and feeling nervous. You know, Gerald, so the problem seems to be that we're both a little nervous to get up here and do this panel, you know? And then you seem really confident. You seem comfortable. Is that right? So you can state what you think their emotional state is and then just ask them, Does that, is that right? It enables people to start thinking again using vocabulary, using cognitive skills. Um, beyond that, you can get up and move, physical movement and physical movement that connects your movement to your breathing uh, is also helpful as well. And then the last thing, this is a nice plug for our climate of trust. It's a you know, fundamental aspect of our curriculum here is establishing a climate of trust and how we do that. Oxytocin is released when people are in relationships where they trust one another and they interact. So if we have a trusting relationship with my coworkers, if I'm triggered and then I have an, a purposeful interaction with a coworker that I trust, oxytocin will actually be released and that counters adrenaline in the body. So there's actually a chemical reaction to back up the value of having a climate of trust in the workplace. Thank you, Amelia. Hey, let me uh, say a word to that. Uh, there's um, two things Amelia did there when she was talking to me to help me come out of my hijack is she showed her value for me. You know, I understand you are feeling this about that. You know, so that kind of gets me, you know, more attuned to what she has to say next. Second thing she did, she, she got me thinking. She kind of got me out of the emotional reaction to now starting to process using my, using my thinking brain. The other thing we can do is there are situations, circumstances, people that kind of make us get a little more excited than we would like to. You know, if we realize that and recognize that, then say, okay, I need to go in and see so-and-so today. I know how so-and-so is. You know, I can say, is this, a, is this a good reaction? Is this going to be positive for both of us because I already have this, you know, feeling towards this person or towards this situation or this place? And then say, well, no, it's not. It's not going to be very. We're not going to be very effective in that environment. So, what can I do differently? And then just kind of sit down and say, okay, you know, here's and go through that same. You know, why? Why do I feel this way? You know, about that. And then what can I do to break that habit? You know, then set up intentional actions. So every time that happens, instead of doing what I, what my script usually tells me to do, I'm going to do this. Then over time, I've broken that and I can move on. Thanks, Gerald. We have a, a question from Facebook. All right, I think this is for the panel. This is from uh, Jessica Kent. Since Army leaders are expected to perform and lead in different and somewhat simultaneous times, how can EI be applied in different scenarios? Examples being garrison duties, field training, to combat operations. Is it a one-size-fits-all skill, or do leaders need to change their responses and how they lead at different times? May I? Uh, Please. Your response will change based on the circumstance, but you know, if you have a higher degree, higher level of emotional intelligence, you know, that dictates you, okay, in this situation, you know, here's how I need to, and with this audience, you know, here's what gets these folks motivated. But it's not a level of having a different type of EI here in Garrison or another one in, in the field or, or downrange, but it's really, you know, if you have a, your emotional intelligence built up enough, it's where you can recognize in this environment, you know, here's what it takes to motivate these folks. In this environment, here's what I need to be able to do. We talk in our uh, L103 lesson on influence about leadership styles, and uh, Dan Goldman, the six leadership styles, you know, and it doesn't say you use one, become one type of person. You may have a predominant style you like, but you have to be able to use them all, and the emotional intelligence piece, particularly the social awareness 
relationship skills piece allows us to kind of, you know, pick and choose the appropriate style for the appropriate uh, environment. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Gerald. Did you want to add something in, Amelia? Uh, no, but I think we have a question. I think Gerald handled that beautifully. Oh, Carl, yes. Thank you. Sue, I appreciate that in-depth answer about uh, the amygdala hijack. Uh, a, an example I would offer to our young captains and majors learned over, you know, my 15 to 20 years as a field grade leader is that a effective way to do that is to build trust with your battalion, brigade, division commander, whoever you're working for, as you progress over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And, uh, you know, being a former hockey player, the amygdala hijack happened to me about 10 times every game. Every time I got hit, my response was, I'm going to punch you in the face. And uh, that doesn't do well because then they put you in the penalty box. But in military operations, where you have a boss that's prone to encounter amygdala hijack, I found it effective to say, sir, general, can we go over here and talk about this? And eventually, the more adept one and attuned one on emotional intelligence would say, thank you for making it get even worse than it could be, and to reduce that 20 minutes to two to three. And, uh, I, I think that's a great skill for all company and field grade officers who are working for senior leaders to be able to do that. It does take some emotional intelligence. You're liable to lose some skin when they go, don't ever do that to me again. Sir, this is why, ma'am, this is why I was trying to do what I was trying to do. And most of them will realize, hey, next time you see me get ready to go, inter you know, try to prevent me from being hijacked. So. I commend that to all of you. That's why emotional intelligence, <coughs> unlike at Fort Bragg, sir, in 1995, when they said emotional intelligence, it's common sense. Why do you have to create this art and science? Wrong answer. That's why I never became part of the Airborne Mafia. But thank you for that detailed answer and uh, <coughs> very effective. Thank you very much. We have uh, another question coming in from Facebook. Yeah, this is from Rod Lab. How do emotional intelligence skills help a leader gain commitment within an organization? Looks like a touch back on the fall semester. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I think it ties back to what Gerald was just talking about with the, the leadership styles. So here in, in CGSC curriculum, we do teach the Goldman Six leadership styles back in L103. Then we move forward into L400, and part of our adaptive leadership uh, theory that we teach as well as a desirable trait for a leader to have means that you have to be proficient at four of the six at any given time. Now that doesn't mean that you just say the other two aren't important, but we do teach that four, you have to be proficient at at least four. Specifically to gain commitment from people, that means that you're going to be able to effectively reach the needs, understand the people that you're working with, and reach them at the level that they need to be able to respond and gain commitment. So for instance, let's say that your emotional intelligence uh, competency of decision making is high. Maybe empathy's not, but you've been working on it, and you got a little bit better at empathy. Well, you may be able to leverage the empathy to help people uh, and, and then also incorporate the democratic or affiliative leadership styles to be able to help people feel like their needs, perspectives, desires mattered, and that they had some influence on the outcome of the decision. It doesn't mean that the decision has to change. That's an important point that we do try to make for everyone, is empathy doesn't mean I change my decision as the leader. Empathy means that I'm listening, I understand the perspective, but I'm still going to be able to make a decision. So while my decision making may be high, I'm working on my empathy, am I effectively able then to use democratic, affiliative, and coaching leadership to make a decision, but still have my force be committed to moving forward and executing on that decision? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, empathy means showing you care as part of getting that commitment. 
you know, if you show you care, you gain trust from the organization as well, from the people in the organization. You build those relationships. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have another question that's available at this time? Here we go. So the Army has BCAP um, to do that 360 look at, at our senior Army leaders or those that are going into command. Do you think the Army is effectively incentivizing emotional leadership or emotional intelligence as a, uh, a key thing to actually being a good leader? I'll try that one. <laughs> <clears throat> The thing that had impressed me the most, I've been looking at it most of the time since probably about 2007. And I started out looking at the leadership requirements model. And I looked at it and I said, wow, you know what? There is an emotional intelligence model right there. So I did some crosswalks between Goldman's model and Ruben Baron's model. I said, these are really, these are really emotional <coughs> intelligence uh, competencies that, and skills that we have here in our leadership requirements model. But as I looked, I didn't see any place else where the Army really focused on, okay, here's EI. Except, like, as I said earlier, we've always taught interpersonal tact and interpersonal skills for leaders, you know, for, 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 for Army soldiers. Uh, <clears throat> and then now we're looking at, okay, we have what we do here. Uh, several years ago, we did a, I, I was part of a group that went to the Cadet Command and we kind of did a workshop for all the uh, battalion commanders on emotional intelligence. I believe they have that in their curriculum there now. But uh, when you say incentivize, you know, I really can't talk to that. But we see where the Army is really recognizing the need, particularly for self-awareness, you know, how you relate to other folks in the BCAP, CCAP, uh, the Kappa and Athena assessments. Uh, but far as I don't really see in the doctrine where we're really pushing, you know, uh, emotional intelligence, except uh, not, not uh, I'd like to say implicitly it's, it's in the doctrine, particularly in 6-22 leadership manual. But I think we're getting there because it's, you know, once again, back to our assessments, you know, even if you look at the, uh, at the, uh, <clears throat> at the uh, OERs, you know, it has all that stuff from the, uh, from the leadership requirements model that folks are evaluated on. You know, but we're not looking at it as emotional intelligence. It does lend to emotional intelligence. Other thoughts? From anybody? Always? I would yes and that, and I, I, I can appreciate your question. Um, the informal and formal elements of our culture are really what we're talking about, right? So we're talking about if we espouse our values, you know, our aspirational selves that we value these traits in our leaders, but then what incentives do we offer for people to develop and apply those at the, you know, at work? That's, that's really what you're asking about, right? So if we go forward, and we look at, okay, what, is our, what are our evals, awards, and promotion system valuing? Yes, at the BCAP, CCAP level, we are doing a great job, I think, in incorporating um, those elements into the decision making that rewards or sends back for further development for some of our personnel. Uh, and I think that that's an important step. How can we uh, do things additionally even before that? what we just said, what are our, you know, what are our awards, what are our evals, and what are our promotions systems value? If they value the whole person concept, if they value the holistic leader that includes these elements, then that will be reflected in who gets those top block OERs, NCOERs. If it's not valued, then it won't. You know, um, the leader requirements model, we often hear from students, you know, it's heavily weighted towards uh, the achieves gets results. You know, less more. You know, less about some of the other areas, but in our doctrine, they're evenly depicted. They're not weighted in our doctrine. So it is in people. So we can have doctrine, but what happens to our doctrine? People have to apply it in the workplace. So if our people are educated and desiring those things from their leaders, we will start to see a bit more reflection in our awards and our evaluations and our promotion system. I believe. I'm encouraged by the, the steps that have been taken, and I really fully expect that we'll continue to make that progress as we go forward. Great. Thank you. Jeff, I'd like you to like to follow up on that question. Mr. Sewell, you remember within the last 10 years about how effective 
emotional intelligence has been. Uh, sort of 10 years ago, we had a deputy commandant who had never heard of the term emotional intelligence. And he came and sat in our classes, and he talked to students, and he talked to faculty. And then when he went to HRC, Gerald, Human Resources Command, he said, you know, and what did we tell him? It's a bit too late to be teaching emotional intelligence to 30, 35-year-old field grade officers. Why aren't we doing it to cadets when they enter West Point or ROTC? And that general officer had Mr. Sewell go to Fort Knox and help them rewrite the curriculum for Bullock at West Point so that our cadets now, that was 10 years ago, they show up, they know what emotional intelligence is. We have to take them to the next level. So that's a huge plus for the Army. And I think we are leading the way, and the Air Force is jumping on it. Maybe the Air Force or the Navy will figure it out sooner rather than later. But that's huge. And then, of course, Mr. Sewell, I think Mr. Schaffner, you know, I had a student five years ago who looked at Army Leadership Requirements Model, the chart on the wall in every classroom, and said, there's something missing. You've got empathy. Where is humility? That is tied to emotional intelligence. So I challenged him. Why don't you do an MO, uh, MMAS? And a year later, when he was in Afghanistan as a fire support officer, the TRADOC commander went over there and gave him a TRADOC coin because that was getting added to the Army Leadership Requirements Model. And so that's what students bring to the fight, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, found value. Those are two pluses that I've seen in the last 10 years that have affected the Army, Army-wide, and the military. Thank, Thank you, you very much for providing those examples. Uh, we had a question on the far side, and we've only got time for a few more questions, so please, go ahead. Ma'am, gentlemen, Major Magaha, uh, I think I'm one of two Marines in the room. Um, my question, we focus a lot on the individual and the EI of the individual. Uh, what are the techniques, or how do you see that application transferring over to the recognition within an organization or within a group? Um, as we know that all of our organizations, we've got you know, leaders at every level from corporals and junior sergeants all the way up to, you know, the commander of the organization. So how do you gauge the emotional intelligence across the, you know, entirety of the organization? John? And I like that we do have a class on what we call the emotional intelligence of teams. And the way you gauge it across the group is how well does that team function? because you know, what happens is it becomes a collective, you know, a collective emotional intelligence. Uh, how well does that team, is that team aware of its members? How well is that team aware of the norms? Uh, how, how does that team police itself? You know, how well does that team work with other teams? You know, and, uh, it, 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 and we always say it starts with the leader. The leader has to be cognizant of what's going on in the team. The leader has to be that example of what emotional intelligence should look like and how we should relate to each other within the, uh, within the team or, for that matter, the organization. Organizations are made of, up of you know, all these separate teams. But it really uh, comes down to that leader f taking that first look at the organization. You know, where, are, where do we want to be, you know, as far as the the, the EI culture of the organization you know, or the emotional intelligence climate of the organization. And then once again, it really looks at the collective. If you have one thorn in there that's really you know, thorn off every, 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 everybody else or every, or every function within the organization, you know, how well does that team kind of look at that and say, okay, here's where we want to be. Here's how we want to relate to each other, relate to other folks, to other teams. So it's really, once again, that the collected emotional intelligence of the organization. And there's practical skills within that. You know, the practical skills of providing feedback. You know, how do you do that and maintain the relationships? You know, the practical skills of being clear and direct with your communication, being able to make timely decisions. You know, there's, there's practical skills that affect an organization, but um, just to, yes, and Gerald, the, the, the organization absolutely has an emotional intelligence uh, aspect to it, and it starts with self-awareness and goal setting for moving forward. 
As a secondary indicator, I'd look at trust, uh, because uh, even if you don't measure emotional intelligence in a unit directly, there's this really strong linkage between emotional intelligence and trust, and in turn, a strong linkage between uh, trust and command climate. So if just because you have a, command a poor command climate and poor trust isn't necessarily an indicator that emotional intelligence is the root cause, could be one of the causes, but it certainly could lead you down to thinking maybe this is one way to solve it. So I would go back to trust as probably probably the indicator that we, we measure as far as, at least in the Army, as far as uh, command climate surveys and those kinds of things that might be able to give you a secondary indicator about how well the organization's doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Major Porras, you had a uh, question earlier? Uh, I'll defer. I'll defer? To, uh, keep things going. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sergeant Major. <laughs> yes, sir. A really great discussion. <clears throat> Thank you for that. But as I think about what you've said uh, as a team, it all depends on self-awareness, right? If, if, if someone is self-aware, you know, we, we can provide, as leaders, we can provide tools of how to be better or, or more emotionally intelligent. But can you train self-awareness? Is that possible? Uh, so I'll come at it from, from my perspective. Um, and this is sort of self-awareness. Uh, you know, what's one of the things I try to do in my elective is build self-awareness in terms of how students are likely to react to a situation. And here's the way uh, I do it. Uh, I will put them intentionally in a situation that's, um, there's some time pressure, it's ambiguous, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I'll give them the task and I'll let them go for about three to five seconds, and then I'll say stop, write down how you feel. Um, and I do that quite a bit, uh, because I want to get them used to monitoring um, how different situations affect them, um, and kind of pull them out of that and give them a chance to step back and build that, that self-awareness. So I think one of the ways to do it um, is to uh, put people in uh, situations that are likely to elicit emotional reactions and then have them reflect. Um, whether it's, you know, my technique, which is, you know, pull them out while the emotion's raw, or during, you know, an AAR or something like that, instead of what went well, what went poorly, of course, those are all important things. But, you know, hey, how did you feel about this task? Um, you, did it make you excited? Did it make you fearful? Um, and I'll find that students react different in different ways to uncertainty. Some of them uh, will, feel, will feel a little bit uh, negative. Some of them will feel, actually feel excited about it. And just building the, that awareness that I'm likely to react to a certain situation in a certain way will help me anticipate it um, and then take those steps that Amelia talked about. So I think that's maybe one way to do it. I think the challenge is getting someone to recognize that they are not self-aware because they have a certain level of self-awareness of who I am, so the challenge is getting them to that gap. You know, recognize that gap in there, okay, I'm cool with me, you know, but yet there's something you, you're not aware of that you're doing that's not uh, resonating with other folks. And some of it goes to what uh, Dr. Lithgow was just saying, what Trent was just saying, is that you sometimes have set up situations where they realize, oh, whoa, wait a minute, maybe I did miss that. Maybe I am not as strong in this area as I need to be. <laughs> Another way is you have to kind of be a coach. Your coaches and mentors you know, come alongside, say, okay, think about this. You know, think about this. You know, maybe you need to work on this area. And it kind of, you know, particularly you find, you, you find a trusted agent, I call them, who can kind of talk to that person and say, yeah, you're good at this, but what about this? You know, to get to, and then kind of help them work on that gap. Trusting relationships, right? So in a trusting relationship, you can do any manner of assessments, activities, in a trusting a small group, maybe it's a one-on-one, -on -one, maybe it's a team, but you can do the, the list of activities or exercises you can do really are quite endless because they're only limited by our creative thinking process to be able to identify ways that cognitive biases might come into play, cognitive dissonance where, you know, I think this thing about myself, but how would others describe it as well? So I mentioned before, you know, let's say you're, you think you're a really great decision maker. That's fantastic. How can that benefit us as a group and an organization, as a team? How could it be not so great? 
where could we think of and brainstorm any situations where an overly decisive leader might actually hinder or harm the, the organization? You know, and get that kind of brainstorming going, but um, it always comes back to trust because as, as you're aware, I'm sure if you provide feedback to someone and they aren't ready to receive it and or you don't have the relationship to, to have that credibility, it will probably cause an amygdala hijack and it will be rejected because of various cognitive biases that will go into play to, to sort of protect the individual's um, sense of who they are. So quick story. Uh, I've been working with Georgetown University to develop a war game that puts students under stress and pressure while making decisions. Uh, when they were play testing it, one of the students at Georgetown, uh, I was the feedback I got was, hey, the, the timer made him really angry and he didn't feel like he had time to think. And I was like, ha 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 ha, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, just putting them in those situations. And I would love to have been there to say, how did that make you feel? Well, I get really mad when uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and I don't feel like I have time. Good, now how can we coach you to make you know, to, to make your assessments faster, to have you make better decisions and to control, uh, not control, but to recognize and then regulate your response to that emotion. Je I can't say control emotions because you can't do that, Gerald. They'll, they'll get me. Manage. Manage emotions. You regulate and manage your emotions. <laughs> regulate and manage. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I know there are a few more questions out there, but we are running out of time. Um, Panelists, could you recommend uh, some books for us and for our audience to consider or some other programs that you may recommend for them to increase their emotional intelligence as a parting, uh, as a parting shout out? It's, I will, but I would like to say one more word. When you think about emotions and decision making, remember the emotions are another point of data to consider. You know, why am I feeling this way? Why do I have this anxiety about this decision? So don't just cast it off, but consider it. Why am I feeling this way? Why are they feeling? Why does the boss feel that way? You know, then you just add that to that collection of knowledge and data you have to inform that decision. Uh, I'll start with the books. Um, I, mine's pretty vanilla. I recommend Daniel Goleman's text. Uh, it's pretty much the foundational text um, in this area. And then uh, my elective is Alpha 714, Hacking the Tactical Brain. It's not all about emotion. It's about making good decisions in battle, but uh, we do spend um, a, one of the lessons on emotion along with um, stress and risk, um, and we do, uh, as I said, try to monitor uh, our emotional reactions uh, to what's going on in the course throughout, so A714. Thank you, Trent. This is Permission to Feel uh, by Dr. Mark Brackett, who is the director of the Emotional Intelligence Center at uh, Yale University. He gets at the stigma we have about showing our emotions and where the place for emotions are, and he talks about how emotions are present just about all the time, should be present in our decisions as well as in other areas of our lives. Uh, a, a good but a little long, but it really has some good stuff in it. Uh, and I'd like to make a plug for the Alpha 722 uh, uh, elective, Emotional Intelligence for Leaders. Uh, we have two, uh, two modules each term. I teach Mod 1. Colonel Schroeder is the, is the instructor for Mod 2. And we do a lot of neat stuff in there, talk about emotions, give a, a assessment. Uh, give a tool for folks to use if they want to work on particular EI skills. Okay. Uh, and my go-to book is Just Listen by Mark Golston. Again, with my theory and action interest, this is a easy read because it's broken into short chapters of practical advice for how to listen to understand. And the subtitle is, you know, discover the secret to getting through to absolutely anyone. And I've found that the techniques in here work really well and my relationships both at home uh, and at work. So it's my go-to text as well. And in addition to the, uh, the other two electives, I also am an instructor for uh, Alpha 713 Mentoring. And it's taught in both terms with Colonel Paul Mustafa and myself and, and Mod 3 for both terms. And uh, we also cover a great deal of practical application using EI relationships because it teaches us how we, we go through how to build a mentoring relationship and all phases of that. Um, so we incorporate a lot of the ideas we've talked about today. So thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, panelists, sir, Sergeant Major, uh, all of our audience members. Thank you for being here today and for joining us for this discussion on emotional intelligence 
and its influence on decision making. I hope it's piqued your interest in EI and will continue uh, your self-education into this area going forward. I um, want you to please keep your eyes open for our next Educating Leaders of Character event, uh, which is going to be a discussion on women, peace, and security coming up March 23rd. So keep your eyes on Facebook and around the area for more details on where and exactly when that will be held. Thank you very much for being here today and appreciate your participation in today's discussion. Congratulations. Hey, good job, y'all. Good, good job. Good job. Good job.